President-elect Bola Tinubu will today realize his dream of a lifetime of becoming president of Nigeria. The official swearing-in ceremony will take place at Eagle Square in the central business district in Nigeria's capital Abuja. And it comes despite the disputes that have trailed the election result. But there are pending legal cases to come and Mr. Tinubu will be forced to continue to defend his INEC declared victory when he's already in Asurok. All right, uh, let's set the ball rolling. This morning, we're joined now in the studio by Arise News Analyst, Professor uh, Biodun Adini. Good morning, and uh, some are already saying Happy Independence Day. <laughs> Nobody even knows how to <laughs> greet on a day like this. May yeah. 29, the day uh, Nigerians have been looking forward to, yeah. including the outgoing uh, president yeah. himself, who before now always said, look, I cannot wait to get back uh, to uh, Daura of course, his homestead in Katsina State, having served eight years. Yeah. Uh, according to him, he finished strong. <laughs> he has run his race. Yeah. And it's time to hand over the baton. And that should be around 10 a.m. Uh, this morning, mm -hmm. May 29th. Your thoughts on a day like this? Mm. It is a very, very important moment, a very important uh, date, day. Mm. Um, for different sections of uh, people, you know, for individuals, for groups, you know, interest groups, and for Nigeria and even Africa and perhaps the world as well, uh, because we're having the seventh consecutive transition. Mm. You know, it is the first time we're going to have this length of um, experimenting democracy. You know, and that's why we keep saying that in terms of longevity, we're doing well. This is another reinforcement of that narrative. And what, what should happen now is. Um, as we're doing well in terms of longevity, we shouldn't also um, be blinded to the fact that we need to Im improve on the character and content of our democracy. Um, so that the quality of democracy, you know, the inherent tenets of democracy, uh, human rights, you know, freedom of speech, and of course, you know, improved standard of living can also begin uh, to come into the fray. And that can come uh, through good governance. But of course, um, it's an important moment for all the beneficiaries, so to say, um, for Pres President Elay Bolati Nubu, and of course his vice, Hashim Shetima, and of course for President Mabangira, um, I beg your pardon, for President Buhari himself, yeah. who is in uh, this true, retiring after eight years. It's, it's a very rare thing to be to lead a country like this, 200 million people, and you've been given that opportunity, and of course you have lived it through, irrespective of um, permutations earlier on, on account of his age, but he has lived it through, um, he has tried his best, hopefully, irrespective of downsides, but he's now calling it a day and saying good night to presidency. You know, I mean, he's, he allows the part he has played in the evolution of this country cannot be rich enough. At some point, we will begin to analyze his successes and failures. Right. But for now, the deed is done. You know, he has uh, fulfilled a part of a journey in the destination to grow Nigeria as a varied nation. Okay, Professor Dini, let, let me come in here because the man uh, to be inaugurated today as Nigeria's president means different things to different people. Different people. And of course, of quite a number of persons, uh, they are all uh, spoken about his uh, sergeant, first as a senator, mm -hmm. and again, most importantly, as governor of Lagos State for eight years. Now, mm -hmm. speak to us of, uh, on what kind of administration, in the next few hours now, uh, he'll be sworn in as president, yeah. the kind of administration Nigerians expect to see from uh, a man, and his uh, vice uh, president-elect who have told the country that the moment they take that oath of office, they'll hit the ground running. Mm -hmm. That's why we don't expect anything less. It's largely a rounded person. It's been, we, we, we presented to us as a businessman and a politician. And if you listen to President Babangida, Babangida yesterday, he described him as somebody with great political skills, you know. And that has also been reinforced by several sections of people uh, describing him as a strategist. So we expect him to bring all this to bear. We saw the exemplification of this to some extent in Lagos State, uh, but the tax now is to replicate it at the national stage. And I also believe that it is not impossible, you know, if he keeps the focus, if he doesn't take his eye off the ball. And how will he do this? We need to understand that um, being president of Nigeria, first, is a privilege. Yes, you must have struggled. Um, you must have deployed some machineries, personal machineries, mm. you know, networking, you know, structures. But of course, it's also some kind of blessing. Now, how do you make the best out of this blessing? By just keeping your eyes on the ball, realizing that you, what you're supposed to do is not service to the South, 
or your family or your friends, but service to the community, the larger population of Nigerians. And mm. this time around, we shouldn't have a president who will just be concerned about rewarding uh, politicians, rewarding loyalists, you know, thinking that, okay, you have come made this contribution, so this is your reward. The state's issue is victory shouldn't be seen as an opportunity, um, like an opportunity to share these points of war, you know. Governance is not about personal aggrandizement. Right. Governance is service to the people. And of course, in the assemblage of, in assembling this cabinet, um, you shouldn't focus, like we said again, on patronage, but also merit is very, very important. Mm -hmm. The injection of right number, right size of technocrats is very, very important. You know, I'm, I'm happy you're yeah. saying this. Yeah, we, saw, we saw this in the, the past, the, in the period the, of Abbas. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sorry to come to that, because yeah. he's, uh, now you're talking about technocrats, because, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, Nigerians will not forget what happened in the uh, Bu uh, Buhari administration, yeah. where he waited for six All of six months. months. Yeah. Uh, so by now, uh, everyone thought, uh, yeah. yes, uh, Balachino, because it, it becomes more difficult when yeah. the incoming speaks about continuity uh, of our government that some people have mm -hmm. actually fought it I think in some areas. I think there's a bill or, is, if, if, or an act already saying that it cannot go beyond a certain time before he announces his left turn. There's already a bill to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I think well, you, also, you also should learn from the lessons of President Muhammad Buhari, you know, because he was right roundly condemned. Six months, and at the end of the day, we didn't see any magic, you know. So why are these six months wait? And in the second turn of President Buhari reduced it to three months. We understand Nigeria is a complex system. You want to do some appropriate balancing, but that shouldn't take up to six months. Before um, you were sworn in the first instance, you had three months, you know, to prepare. They right. were taking another um, three, six months. Mm -hmm. That's that's too much to take, you know. But I don't think that. How do I think I you should be smarter than that right. and not wait for that long. And of mm -hmm. course, he's been traveling. We've been told severally that he's been traveling to go and contemplate, ruminate over this. We expect that in the last mm -hmm. three months he must have been putting, uh, trying to get it as right, you know, so that um, he will not take too much time. Because Ngozi, right. and there's a, sorry, mm -hmm. one last point. Mm -hmm. There's a point in saying that governance suffers a lot, you know, when the commanding height of administration is left at those who are just um, at, the, at the level of implementation. Policy directions are usually. Profit, but by those who are holding the of, uh, all the political offices, mm -hmm. represented in ministers, uh, special assistants, etc., etc. Absolutely, and you would expect that these people that you're going to be appointing or picking, mm -hmm. if you like, would share the same dream to a very large extent. You know, with a man mm -hmm. who all of his life, mm -hmm. according to him, he spent uh, a large chunk of his political yeah. life, you know, hoping to become Don't, president uh, of Nigeria uh, someday. And according to him, he said, look, because of the dire situation that Nigeria finds herself, uh, it, you know, for him, it became a dream yeah. to extricate mm -hmm. Nigeria you know, from the shackles of these strongholds, whether it's poverty, yeah. uh, corruption, mm -hmm. you know, economic uh, you know, dire straits, and what have you. Um, how difficult or easy do you think it will be for him to actually pick a cabinet? Let's even still you know, okay. dwell on that a little. Because we're hearing now that there's some kind of tension yeah. within the <laughs> Tinubu camp yeah. as to who he will pick. There are people who over the years have always been there mm -hmm. with him. They've worked with him, you know, suffered with him, struggled with him, whether in the political trenches and all of that. All of those people, especially with the presidential campaign council and yeah. all of that. How difficult or easy would it be for Tinubu to pick the right people to actually hit the ground running like we heard from Kashim Shatima? Yeah, I, I also I want to believe that it's not a stroll in the park, you know, to select or to choose cabinet members in a complex society like, like ours where we have a range of politicians, you know, um, you know, a scope of technocrats. It can be very problematic, but it shouldn't uh, be also be difficult for a leader that has foresight, that has vision, that knows what he wants to do. And this is a time that a leader shouldn't be nice. You shouldn't be picking um, your mm. cabinet because you want to be nice. You want to be a nice person. You should just be on the basis of merit. And if not on the basis of merit, if you are choosing politicians, just ensure that that polit politician can deliver the goods. You know, because at the end of the day, what we want is meeting the yearnings and aspirations of the people. So his leadership quality will be challenged in the process of taking this decision. That might be his first biggest, biggest challenge. Biggest challenge. But I also think that because he's a strong character, that's what uh, some of us probably haven't tried. It's, it's, it's a very strong um, character, very strong will. You may not look it, maybe on account of age. And of course, age might, have been, might be telling on him now, so he may not 
um, be demonstrating it in his gates, you know, and of course in his uh, dispositions and mannerism, but he's got strong will. And we expect this to be brought to bear in the mm. choice of his persons, of his personal, of lieutenants around him. There are some states where you have up to six, seven qualified people, politicians and technocrats. What is he going to do? Of course, you can't choose more than one, at most two. In some instances, mm. you don't. Uh, we just, uh, because of they course, the be federal character that must the reflect. Most, and of course, mm. governance shouldn't just be um, service. Shouldn't just be limited to holding uh, political positions mm. or holding government offices. There are different ways in which you can serve a nation, and different right. ways you can talk to people to serve the nation, rather than you just being in an executive office. You know, um, signing um, mm. signing memos, etc. Um, etc. So mm -hmm. I, I think that his trade will be brought to bear. Obasanjo didn't do badly in this regard. You know, he was very firm and uh, he told people yeah, that yet, we we'll remember, uh, that yet you, you probably contributed to my ascension mm -hmm. to presidency. Uh, but if you contributed because you thought um, that was going to be to be an investment, this is a bad investment. It was very, very frontal. It came out clear. So people were on guard and people were whipped into line. When they got appointed, they were happy. When they were not appointed, they didn't also mind, you know, and that's how it should be. But I do not think that it should just be about placating people. It should be about delivery. Yeah. You know, what are you going to bring to the table? If you cannot bring anything to the table, uh, please step aside. That has been, uh, been really keeping people in positions of power, you know, particularly in the last year, eight years, I dare say, when they're obviously inefficient. Well, let me jump in here again and look at, uh, well, a quick one here, what uh, some have described as booby traps uh, for the incoming administration. Yeah. Now, you spoke about uh, the slow start of uh, Buhari administration, mm -hmm. but again, we saw some kind of speed, uh, you know, uh, in the twilight of the Buhari administration, mm -hmm. whereby there were a lot of appointments, and some have termed those mm -hmm. as booby traps uh, for the, uh, mm -hmm. incoming, the incoming administration. administration. Yeah. And we also have the issue of insecurity we mm. also have the issue of separatist uh, you know movements how do you think the president uh, elect uh, will be able to handle these yeah and that's why questions were raised in the first instance that this is a very difficult time for anybody to become president of nigeria but i'm happy that the president elect said it last night that he has mm -hmm. a difficult task no doubt mm -hmm. but do not pity me i mm -hmm. asked for this job I and he gave it. It to me. so mm -hmm. i mean he has said about rolling he has uh, given us confidence that it's up to the task and we have to look up to him you know difficulties are already there he saw it campaigned for it you know worked hard for it and got it at the end of the day um, we're going to continue probably from where President Buhari stopped. But what we're expecting now um, is to try to change the narrative, bring about improvement, you know, realizing mm. that leadership, uh, if you can if even improve on some of the downsides of President Buhari, I think you'll probably do better. You know, and what are those downsides? Buhari was a taciturn person, you know, less communicative, less engaging, sometimes looking, um, you know, aloof. And it was a problem, you know, yeah. for the system, because yeah. there's a sense in saying that, you know, when you communicate, you share ideas, uh, people feel your presence, they will have this belief, this confidence that action has been taken um, in some regard. You give to, give it to Buhari that in terms of trying to be transparent, is he, he's not done badly in that area. He's a, looks a transparent person and honest person, mm. you know, a man of integrity. People have disputed this, but I still believe that he has integrity go, using so many parameters that we may not be able to go, uh, that go into. But the downside of this was that he was the only one that seemed to be, that, that seems to possess those values, right. those virtues. Now, and he couldn't, um, <laughs> it was <laughs> like an oasis he, he of could, integrity. He couldn't permit, yeah. you he couldn't know, permit he, the dimensions he, of his left hand. So, absolutely. You know, so if uh, uh, incoming President Tinubu can improve on those areas, you know, communicate a little more, you know, engage more with the people, mm. let's have your presence, you know. Mm. And of course, do not forget that those days we used to have monthly media press bef uh, presidential yeah. briefing. What happens to that? You know, we don't want the president and we'll be question. cocooned in the villa. And we, don't, we don't know that we'll have a leader at all. Leadership is about presence. You know, it's mm. about An a portrayal, engagement. Mm. The, the popular will feel now, let's uh, even backtrack a little uh, to President Buhari's last speech yeah. as president. Uh, of course, he said quite a lot. I, I heard uh, Chikoge, uh, one of uh, Arise News analysts, say that if 
this the content of this speech were made in 2015 maybe a lot of things would have been different because it was as far as it was concerned quite inspiring you know words and all of that but let me pick from paragraph 12 uh, where or 11 before before 12 where he actually uh, referred to Bola Tinubu as his brother friend and fellow worker in the political terrain in the last mm -hmm. you know 10 years and he said look you've indeed worked for this day and God has crowned your efforts I have no doubt that your passion for excellence reliance on competence, uh, fairness mm -hmm. in relationships, commitment to equity, loyalty to the country, and desire for Nigeria to be globally relevant would come through uh, for you. That's uh, Buhari, mm -hmm. you know, uh, talking to Tinubu there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, these traits are what Buhari finds in Bola Tinubu, mm -hmm. and you think that all of this would come to bear mm -hmm. in the way he Ooh. handles his affairs yeah, as yeah, president yeah, of yeah. Nigeria. Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, we just have to wait to be able to capture um, the picture properly, you know. But I think that he was presidential there. Um, what else do we expect him to say other than being positive about the incoming president? And uh, do not forget that uh, they've been together. They were together quite all right from mm. 2014 when they were trying to put together the parties, um, the groups that yeah. saw of President mm. uh, Good Luck uh, Jonathan, Jonathan, you know, and so. And they've been together, they worked in a situation where we actually thought that it was not going to work. But they've come this far, they put themselves together, and this is what we have seen. People have even argued that um, it was a kind of arrangement that probably we're not aware of, that mm. you go first, mm. do your eight years, then and I'll come, come and do you. my own. You know, mm. Well, it has, has come out now. They so were is it safe to say that maybe Buhari is a John the Baptist and uh, Tinobu is the... <laughs> Christ we've been waiting for? We can draw any kind of analogy. For, 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 for those who understand the scripture. For those who understand. <laughs> well, ahead on the inauguration special of Daybreak. In his farewell message, outgoing president Buhari apologizes for economic policies that brought hardship on Nigerians. All right, thanks for staying with us. It's a special inauguration day on Arise News, and thank you for joining us. We've been uh, joined, of course, by Professor Abiodun Adini, uh, Bayes University and Arise News uh, analyst. Uh, well, uh, Prof, mm -hmm. thank you so much for staying with us. Mm -hmm. Well, before we went on that break, uh, we read that uh, intro about President Buhari's apology to Nigerians for his seeming harsh uh, economic policies. Mm -hmm. What do you make of these uh, apologies? I mean, leadership, like some would say, is not a popularity yeah, contest. contest. There are times yeah. when a leader mm -hmm. has to take the tough you Decision. know, decisions yeah. because at the end of the day, he sees further than the people. Yeah. But what do you make of these uh, apologies? If, 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 if you don't yeah. mind, perhaps mm -hmm. let, let's hear him. Let's okay. hear from the horses yeah. now yeah. before, before, before you come before, back. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah, it's okay. All right. and our elected representatives remain accountable to the people, I am leaving behind an electoral process which guarantees that votes count, results are credible, elections are fair and transparent, and the influence of money in politics reduced to the barest minimum, and Nigerians can elect leaders of their choice. We are already seeing the outcome of this process as it provided an even playing field where persons without any political godfather or access to money defeated other well-resourced candidates. The Nigerian economy has become more resilient due to the various strategies put in place to ensure that our economy remain afloat during cases of global economic downturns. Our administration also provided an enabling environment for the private sector to engage in businesses for which their return on investment is guaranteed. The private sector proved a strong partner in our drive to build a resilient and sustainable economy as evidenced by the growing number of turnkey projects in various sectors of the economy. In the course of rebuffing the economy, we made some difficult choices, 
most of which yielded the desired results. Some of the measures led to temporary pain and suffering for which I sincerely apologize to my fellow countrymen, but the measures were taken for the overall good of the country. So right. you heard? Mm. Heard him there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> saying, um, I mean, largely to a very large extent, yeah. I mean, the, the president there said that the Nigerian economy has become more resilient uh, due to the various strategies put in place to ensure that our economy remained afloat uh, during cases of global economic downturns. Um, how much impact, really, would you say those economic policies had vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the apologies that, you know, President Muhammad Buhari has had to make over some of his, uh, you know, economic uh, policy decisions? Well, first, I think it's, uh, it's a human being, no matter what, and it's okay for him to feel bad if um, some of his policies didn't work well, you know. Apologizing is normal. Sometimes we also say that um, it's a mark of courage to be able to come down from his high horse and apologize. Some other leaders may not necessarily do so, but doing that, you know, um, he's just letting us know that he tried his best, you know, but there might be um, some failures. Please forgive me in these areas of failure. That will be left to, Niger to Nigerians to decide, really. And um, you know, with respect to the economic policies, well, that might also be a matter, of, um, a matter for debate, you know. Mm. Um, for me, I don't think that um, he did well in that sphere, you know. There were so many options that, um, so many sal much more salutary options that were available for him. I don't believe in this um, continuous and excessive borrowing. There are other alternatives to borrowing, you know. Um, what about cutting waste? What about engendering transparency? What about improved accountability? And uh, what about, you know, um, reordering your priority, you know? Heavy reliance on, on borrowing in a situation where we're having problem between our, our debt to GDP ratio uh, is becoming a problem, you know, but they kept telling us that it's not about debt to GDP ratio. It's about debt to revenue. Your debt to revenue, you know. I mean, debt to revenue ratio, we're having yeah. problems, and it shouldn't be but um, at, the at other a point, way. I mean, uh, according to the World Bank, even the IMF, mm -hmm. saying that Nigeria spends about 96% of her revenue. On, and which on, is actually which on, is actually shameful. Remembering that um, the source of our revenue source was dwindling, you yeah. know, and there was no hope that we're going to recover from that. Yes, we know that we passed through difficult times. COVID nineteen was there, you know. But again, mm -hmm. why should we continue to spend almost endlessly, um, trying to apanagealize um, rich civilized nations who are also indebted? You know, you cannot be comparing yourself to the United States of America. Um, arguably the most indebted nation on, in the world, or Japan, which is mm. next to the United States, you know, thinking that debt owing to mon money is not a problem, you know, but we are different, you know, we don't have, our economy is not as stimulated as those ones. The multipliers in those economies are much more expansive than ours, you know, we are a trying country, there's no stability here, there's no predictability, we are bogged down by insecurity, we are bogged down by overpopulation, we are bogged down by illiteracy, ignorance, lack of understanding, mm. and of course we are seeing these things right before us, and the little we have, you know, we are not using well, we are borrowing more, and, and obviously frittering for consumption. For like consumption. So, there was, there, there, um, he's left behind the great, uh, some problem really, but it is not um, to say that there cannot be remedy. Um, governance, economic management is just about uh, building confidence, engineering confidence. Mm -hmm. The body language of the leader matters, you know. Mm -hmm. It is the body language of the leader first that will determine and their pronouncements, um, that will determine, determine the number of goodwill, you know, goodwill gestures that they get both locally and internationally. If there's assurance that there's security, of course, we know that capital will flow in. But of uh, course, we know that capital takes flight, you know, where there's insecurity. Mm. So and and, and uh, the yeah, I think that, that, that's uh, an important point you just picked here, and that brings us to our economic management team, uh, which we've seen mm. in the past, uh, mm. and uh, whereby people from the private business sector were actually uh, brought in closer to government to give advice. Because it's one thing to see these people, the politicians in this case, as candidates, have such pally with the business environment, the business mm. community. But uh, sometimes when they finally get into office, uh, they actually uh, you know, separate from that community. Mm -hmm. now, now, speak to us on the kind of head hunting uh, that should be going on now mm. in terms of fixing uh, our economy. 
Uh, uh, that's a very, very important question, really, but because in the last eight years, with due respect, we haven't seen uh, so much seriousness in this regard. You know, there are some delicate um, areas that government should really focus on. The economy is very, very important. The health sector is very, very important as well. Education is no less so. Those are areas, you know, that should be managed by experts, not people who will come and learn on the job. Regrettably, we had a minister saying that he knew nothing about the sector until he was appointed. That's not the kind of thing we should, thing we should see um, in a 21st century knowledge economy, you know, where... Um, if, if, if you don't mind, let me stop yes. you there and allow you bring in your communication expertise to bear. What mm. does that say, say of that itself. minister? Uh, well, he's, or he's, the one who appointed him? No, no, no. The, a, minister, a minister who's saying mm. that I, I've been running the ship uh, yeah, without, I think, I think, yeah. without, without a compass. I think he was being frank to a fault. Yeah. yeah frank to a fault. To a fault, yes. Yeah, he was just being honest, but that was to a fault because mm. um, he, he thought... He didn't need to put it out there. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe lacked a better way of putting it because, um, yes, he was trying to be honest, to come clean, you know, but it was a disservice. And to not just the rep his reputation, but also to the reputation of the person who appointed him. Because mm. it shows that there was no... Um, clear check about you know, there was no test, and that's why the people have been, have been advocating that if names of ministers will go to the Senate, portfolios should let's be have the portfolio so that they can be agreed on the basis of um, their understanding of the ministry. Mm -hmm. And if they do not show good understanding, can you look for somewhere else and put them, please, or probably drop them? And that's why we're saying that this thing shouldn't just be about patronage, about yeah. reward, about trying to um, gratify myself to somebody because it's this, that, and that. You know, it shouldn't just be about connectionism, about nepotism, about do-goodism. It's about mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. results, you know. I mean, what, what are you going to bring to the table, uh, like we uh, say uh, in local uh, palace? What this then means is that we, we need to have a, a check system uh, to actually... Uh, see the competence of these people. Uh, for instance, well, uh, the have, era that's of... That's why you uh, have the legislature, uh, uh, you know, the era of uh, take a bow and... and, and no, no, but, but I think we shouldn't miss the fact that it is largely, most, most of these appointments are largely the prerogative of the president. Oh, certainly. And that's why if the president uh, is not the right person for the job, they will have a problem of an issue. You know, yeah, still, we have seen instances... Give, it doesn't give the license not to actually check to see if the person is actually competent enough to... You know, he roll, has a license, he can, hire and, he can hire and fire... Uh, mm -hmm. But how I many of them have, you actually have this courage? We can give it to Obasanjo. Sanjo. He had the courage largely. Jonathan, to some extent, you know, yeah, well, of course, unfortunately, he didn't live long enough for us to be able to dissect him properly. Mm -hmm. uh, but Buari, maybe he was nice, maybe he was loyal because he kept them for as long as possible. And sometimes where there are reasons for them to, sh reason for him to show them the, the exit, All he right. wouldn't. He, they continue to paper the crack. All right, Prof, just uh, <laughs> bear with us for a minute and let's bring uh, viewers some more stories. It's a wet day in Nigeria's capital, Abuja, today. Well, President-elect uh, Bola Ahmed Tinubu will today be sworn in as the 16th president of Nigeria. The official ceremony at Eagle Square in Abuja will happen amidst tight security. In attendance will be a presidential delegation from the U.S., uh, led by U.S. Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, Marcia Fudge. Well, South Africa's President Cyril Ramaphosa has arrived in Nigeria for the inauguration of President-elect Bola Tinubu. He joins other heads of state and government from around the world, including Rwandan President Kagame, who will be attending the event, marking the seventh consecutive democratic transition in Nigeria's history. All right, still here in the studio is a Rise News analyst, Professor Abiodu Adini. Let's mm. even talk about the world leaders that are coming yeah, in. They're yeah, coming yeah. in already. Uh, on paper, about 65, mm. uh, you know, uh, mm. world leaders are being expected. But a lot, number of Nigerians have been raising the eyebrow over, you know, the representation coming from the U.S., uh, saying it's not high up enough. And the Canadian, the leader of the Canadian uh, delegation also happens to be a secretary for housing. And all, I'm, well, what's this thing about <laughs> housing <laughs> and, you know, uh, 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 development and what have you? But really, uh, well this definitely, a lot of world leaders want to witness mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, your, your thoughts on... On this so on far, the, I mean, leaders the, are coming in already. Yeah, well, that's a good one. Yeah. Despite the controversies we're still having um, world leaders, respectedly anyway, not surprisingly showing yeah. interest in uh, um, the inauguration. And on the quality of representation, it might not really matter if you look at the um, level at which we relate with some of these countries. We have 
um, what international relations we we'll call whether a vertical or a horizontal perhaps a vertical relationship with these countries you know they are much more um, sophisticated they might give different reasons for the level of their delegation it doesn't really matter what matters is that they have a presence here you know and uh, if at the end of the day we're able to um, reorganize ourselves you know um, work on a comeback from the tailspin that we're probably declining into um, the regard they will have, have for us will also be on the rise. It's about the input we put into, um, in, into our country, into uh, ensuring that there's productivity and efficiency yeah. at different levels. And of course, we're having at the top a challenge of African leaders come in. That's gratifying enough. We are a very important, influential country on, in Africa. Critical African leaders have arrived. You know, one of them delivered a masterpiece yes, uh, yeah, three days ago. Yeah, so Uhuru Kenyatta. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta. And of course, yeah. Yeah, if his uh, prescriptions are implemented, we know that in the next four years, if they're implemented by Bola Tinubu, we know that in the next four years, we won't be where we are. Let me, let me jump on that, yeah. because uh, that's a man who actually uh, does... does uh, uh, you know, philosophy now you know, yeah. on the continent called the handshake, which uh, Uhuru Kenyatta actually implemented, yeah. uh, reaching out to Raila Odinga then, who was That's in right. opposition. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, looking at what's happening now to Bola Tinubu, we, uh, we understand already we know his candidacy and uh, presence still divides Nigerians. Uh, and he occupies the best position to yeah. actually mm -hmm. uh, bring Nigerians together. Looking at the Kenyan handshake recipe, uh, you know, and that lecture by Uhuru Kenyatta, yeah. uh, how soon uh, or what, what are the likelihoods that we, we, we President-elect uh, Tinubu will quickly uh, reach out to every other part of the country that is not so excited about uh, him becoming president? Yeah, I don't think he should. He has an option, Suleiman. I don't think he has an option as a leader, mm. you know, um, before the election, uh, you belong to APC, but after the yeah. election, the elected president, you are the president of Nigeria, mm -hmm. you know, of everybody in Nigeria, you are the father of the nation, so to say. Uh, you do not have to govern the populace discriminating against one section. And from the Uhuru Kenyatta argument, um, the absence of conflict is not necessarily an evidence of peace, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you have to talk, be concerned about the opposition, irrespective of what your supporters will say, because your supporters will say, this one did, 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 did that, you know, so do not reward them. No, that's not how it should work. I expect him yeah. to find ways of gratifying sections like the Southeast, um, who are unhappy for several reasons. I don't know if it, is, if it is safe to say this. If I have to recommend to him, I would say, please go ahead in your inaugural or inauguration speech and release Canon Wako, whatever it takes, please. Just release him. No, just have him. Can't, can't, um, can't. I beg your pardon. <laughs> you know, okay, fine. Yeah, just go ahead yeah. and, and release him. And let's have mm -hmm. a fresh start. You know, let's, con let's reconcile. Let's build peace, you know, consensus, you know, so that it can rub off on other, other sectors of... Uh, of, of the economy, of the life. country, yeah. yeah. Those are the, he, those he are the important steps that he should yes. take. You know, and he shouldn't uh, see himself as the president of the North that supported mm. him, or the president of the Southwest, mm. or the South South that supported him. He should be president of all, yeah. without um, outcasting any section. Yeah. All right, so we'll still come back to you, yeah. uh, Professor yeah. Adini. Let's uh, mm. look at uh, some other stories here. Uh, president uh, elect uh, Tinubu and the APC government uh, as it's set to set uh, its sights on the inauguration today. Former President Goodluck Jonathan is urging reforms in the electoral system that will leave a lasting impact on Nigeria's democratic credentials. Uh, Mr. Jonathan was speaking in an exclusive interview with Arise News. Take a listen. Uh, the President elect uh, Ahmed Bola Tinubu and the Vice President elect uh, Senator. Uh, Shatima, uh, their own mood is slightly different because President Buhari has graciously served eight years. God has helped him serve eight years. And he's handing over, not to another political party, but he's handing over to his own political party. So the circumstances presently is quite different. But I know the mood of the country generally is because of the issues bordering on the elections. So some people are happy, some people are sad, so all kinds of sentiments and feelings. In my own time, especially the 2015 election, my ministers, my senior uh, officers, people who worked with me, there was this fear that this one that we've lost the election, what would be our fate? With the new government just threw all of us into jail without giving us even fair hearing, because government is next to God and decide to do anything. 
that fear was in the minds of uh, people. Some people feel, could I even run away? Should I stay in the country? But to them, that will not be much of a problem because it's the same party that uh, has taken over. So uh, the tension we faced then, the Buarez team may not face the same tension. Yes, some few people may have some issues that bother them, but on the average, they will not have that kind of uh, feeling. But it used to be tense, really. And uh, by this time, then of course, already I've considered the vote to the president. So that was completely over. And I knew why I considered the vote, because I was more interested in the country than myself, which I advise every politician to be more interested in the country than themselves. Without a country, there will be no president. So I know it used to be tense. And how do we ensure that Nigeria comes out of the current electoral controversy uh, through reforms that will help grow the country's democracy? The problem we have is the electoral management body, INEC, and the security. And I used to give an example. If two soccer teams are playing and the referee decide to look the other way, they will enjoy themselves. If people are contesting for elections, should expect that it's like a soccer game. Everybody wants to win. And, see, and you must not allow it. The electoral management bodies uh, share more than 60% of the blame. Because if they do their work well, the politicians will have no choice than to follow the rules. They, the security, and the courts. I believe one day we'll get there, but I feel sad now that uh, our electoral process is still wobbling. So we have migrated from Canada to Viva, which is a superior technology. Why do we still have problems? Manual voting, we have problems in this country. Electronic, we have vo So where is the problem coming from? Is the independent electoral, uh, the electoral management board is INEC in this case. INEC has to sit up so that they will not throw this country into conflagration one day. And people must be serious, and NEC must sit up. We should commission one of these internationally uh, known IT companies. They will want to protect their image and allow them to build a system for us and also manage it during our elections. We can train our people, but they should manage it. That this last election, they say, oh, one director in charge of IT did this or did not do that. If you bring Google or one of these uh, giants and they agree to build it and manage it for you, there will be nobody in Nigeria who will not be involved. Yeah, former President Goodluck mm -hmm. Jonathan, the one Nigerian president who actually, you know, made that historic a uh, phone call to mm -hmm. say congratulations uh, to the winner of the election. And he's really earned the right, yeah. you know, to advise any incoming uh, leader, including, of course, the electoral umpire. Uh, uh, Prof, you, you, you heard mm -hmm. yeah, from our yes. president, good luck, Jonathan, yeah. there, saying, I mean, comparing any electoral process, elections yeah. mm -hmm. especially, uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, to uh, a soccer uh, game, yeah. football game, where the referee cannot afford to look the other way. Mm -hmm. saying that, well, we will get there, but my question is exactly when will Nigeria get there oh, well, as well, far as election management is concerned? We're working at it. Just that we Are should, we working at it enough? Uh, hopefully. The last one will have been excellent, but for the IRF um, uh, question, otherwise we will have said we have moved um, you know, a notch higher. You know, but what President Jonathan is saying is also very spot on. Like you said, I agree. He's a very noble person, a dignified and reputable person on account of what he did in 2015. That's gone a long way in deepening our democracy, letting us know that it's actually possible. You know, so that's an evidence of his action was an evidence of the chances that we we'll still have in the future. So it's an epitome of change as the case could be, you know. Then, of course, there are two things, important things that he mentioned. We can continue to enhance technology. Yeah. You know, technology is inanimate, you know, can perfect processes and procedure. So let's continue to enhance it. Even if we don't have the capacity, there's nothing wrong. Yeah. And in using foreign expertise, you know, and they're all available. Then the second thing he also raised, which is also very important, is about recruitment, you know. And besides, he says several leaves that, um, you know, there's, a, there's sometimes it's not, it doesn't also pay, you know, to just appoint people because you want to please people. 
Sometimes right. that he said he appointed President, uh, uh, Professor Jega, for instance, um, when he didn't know him. He never knew him at all. He was just sure the man would deliver. He wasn't expecting anything from him. And of course, um, it worked out somehow. That way, he lost. He won the first election. That president, uh, Professor Jega. But he couldn't have made that appointment he blindly. Yeah. He must have looked at his resume. No, you will check. But you, you, I mean, yeah, not, not the question what, of and what he brings. Him. You know, to the table based on his he, background and all because that. he knew that Jega was an expert. Yeah, exactly. He was a political, a political exactly. scientist, we need to stress that an point. expert who could deliver. Yeah. And Jega largely delivered. Mm -hmm. First election, yeah. President Jonathan won. Second one, Buhari won. But, but uh, Jega wanted to see that. Professor Adini, yeah. you, you have a point that because we've seen politicians, uh, you know, uh, take a gamble, uh, you know, in appointments, and uh, these are very uh, costly. Uh, you know, that gamble is uh, what Nigeria cannot. Uh, no, we can't do it. It costs us a lot, really. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you.